Yes, children, this uh, travelogue, Silk Road, we were doing. Nick Middleton, along with uh, Suzanne and uh, his uh, interpreter, Daniel, they reached uh, Hor, and from Hor, his, uh, Daniel, you know, he left, and Suzanne was left, because Suzanne was a driver, and who, whose purpose was to make him reach his destination. So the place Hor, narrator Nick Middleton, found very horrible, because it was exactly in contrast to what he had already read about this in various uh, travelogues of the people, those who had visited it earlier. Because those people had described this place uh, as uh, like the one which was very, very like picturesque, beautiful, as at the same time, it had its great spiritual value. But he did not find it as such, because it was uh, a very arid, dry, and uh, the place where there were piles of, you can say, garbage and all. And moreover, here his condition, his physical condition also started deteriorating. And by the time he reached Darchan, his condition had become quite worst. And he even had to visit the doctor, the hospital. Suzanne took him there. And there he was given medicine by the Tibetan doctor. He had to take a course of five, day, five days. And uh, on the very first day when he took the medicine, he was able to sleep well at night. Right? This much we had done. So we were here on page number 80. Second paragraph I'm going to read out. So Darchan didn't look so horrible after a good night's sleep. So when you are able to have a, a nice sleep at night at, at the place, that place doesn't seem to be that horrible as it is when you are not even able to sleep. So the previous night, he was not even able to sleep well in Darchan. But now, because of the medicine, he was able to sleep well. So now he didn't find it that horrible. It was still dusty, partially derelict, and punctuated by heaps of rubble and refuse. But the sun shone brilliantly in a clear blue sky, and the outlook across the plain to the south gave me a vision of the Himalayas, commanded by a huge snow-capped mountains. So though this place was still, you know, uh, punctuated by heaps of rubble and refuse, yet when he saw the sun shining brilliantly in the clear blue sky, and when he was able to have the picturesque view of the Himalayas, uh, the, uh, you know, along with the snow-capped mountains, he felt even better. Uh, Gurla Mandata with just a wisp of cloud suspended over its uh, summit. So this is the place which he uh, finds uh, suspending from over the summit. The town had a couple of rudimentary general stores selling Chinese cigarettes, soap, and other basic provisions. So this town, Darchan, there were some, you know, uh, basic, uh, there's some, some stores which were selling some basic items, uh, like uh, Chinese cigarettes, soap, or other very, very basic things which one might need on a, on a tourist, uh, on this kind of place. So as well as the usual strings of prayer flags. So in those Chinese stores, the narrator was able to find some basic things which one might need. And uh, there were some other uh, stores where he could find the flags. In front of one, men gathered in the afternoon for a game of pool. Uh, the battered table looking supremely incongruous in the open air, while nearby women washed their long hair in the icy water of a narrow brook that babbled down past my guest house. So there were some general stores where one could get very basic things. And, uh, uh, and there he saw one, uh, a place where some people were game, playing a game of pool. So he found that uh, game of pool, that table, you know, quite uh, inappropriate uh, in contrast to the open air. So, and nearby there was a river, women were washing their hair and all. Uh, so that river, you know, it babbled down, it, you know, made noise. He could hear it, its babbling sound uh, from his guest house also. Darchan felt relaxed and unhurried. But for me, it came with a significant drawback. There were no pilgrims. So this Darchan, you know, it was a rather relaxing and uh, uh, re relaxing place where there was no, not much traffic. But yes, the, he found a big, big drawback in this place. What was that drawback? That there were no pilgrims. So this Nick Middleton had gone to do Kora. He was a pilgrim to this place. So when you go to a place as a pilgrim, you need 
you you want that there should be some other people for the same purpose also so as a lonely pilgrim uh, you don't really enjoy in that place so what was the drawback in that place like there was no other person the one who could accompany him to do the pura around the mount kailash i had been told that at the height of the pilgrimage season the town was bustling with visitors many brought their own accommodation enlarging the settlement round its edges as they set up their tents which spilled down onto the plain i would i had time to my arrival for the beginning of the season but it seemed it was that i was too early so narrator nick middleton had been told like by the uh, when it's a uh, real pilgrim season when it's at the height of the pilgrimage then people really come in large numbers and then people even come up with their own accommodation because then people might not be able to get their accommodation in the hotels and all so people during the actual pilgrimage season come in large numbers with their own accommodation with their own tents and all so the narrator nick middleton had planned his uh, pilgrimage uh, in the beginning of the season but uh, the way he had been able to uh, you know reach here the way there was no other person over there so it was very clear that he had come a bit earlier okay he was too early to this place then one afternoon i was i sat pondering my options over a glass of tea in darchan's only cafe so there was just one cafe only and uh, there he was having a glass of tea not a cup of tea uh, and was thinking about like what he should do because he was quite apprehensive about his pilgrimage because there was no other person because if you go to the place like mount kailash so you need somebody with you you cannot go there all alone especially when you are new to this place uh, so he was thinking like what should he do after a little consideration i concluded they were severely limited so there were very less options with him clearly i hadn't made much progress with my self help program on positive thinking so though he tried his best to remain positive yet he was not able to make much progress with his with his optimism also because people say like you should always think positive you should say positive but when there is actually nothing when there is no positive outcome coming out of uh, even whatever you are desiring you know then one becomes a little depressed so in my defense i it hadn't been easy with all my sleeping difficulties so in my defense it hadn't been easy with all my sleeping difficulties but however i looked at it i could only wait the pilgrimage trail was well trodden but i didn't fancy doing it alone so he had been thinking about like whether he should go alone or not but no he dared not go alone because of his own ailments or the problems which he had been you know uh, suffering so though he knew that his sleeping difficulties had reduced to a, a bigger extent yet uh, when he thought about going to the mount kailash alone he could not think about it the only option left with him was to wait for what to wait hmm? for other people to come he started waiting for the other pilgrims to come okay so that he would get some company <clears throat> the pilgrimage trail was well trodden so the pilgrimage trail so the place where he had to go as a pilgrim the place where he had to go that place was well trodden it was like a a, a nice place to go to uh but i had i didn't fancy doing it alone but he could not imagine going alone over there <clears throat> the kora was seasonal the kora i've already told you is uh, taking the round of the place okay when you take the parikrama that is when you take the round of a place holy place uh, it is called as kora the kora was seasonal because parts of the route were liable to blockage by snow so that kora it's not that you could do kora any time of the year it was seasonal only because otherwise the road would be blocked by snow 
I had no idea whether or not the snow had cleared, but I wasn't encouraged by the chunks of dirty ice that still clung to the banks of Darchan's brook. So he did not have any idea. This uh, Nick Middleton had no idea whether the road, the route uh, that uh, where the Kora would be done, whether it was clear of snow or not. He did not have any idea, but yet he was able to see the uh, see the chunks of ice around that very river where uh, he had seen the women washing their hair and all, right? Since Cezanne had left, I hadn't come across anyone in Darshan with enough English to answer even this most basic question. So what was the biggest drawback uh, this is, uh, Nick Middleton had to suffer was his language gap. You know, this Nick Middleton knew only English, and in this place, when Cezanne had left, he had no one to rely upon uh, in asking the simplest question, like if the road is clear on that route or not. Got it? So this is how the languages, you know, play so much, in, very important part. Because when you go to a place, wherever you go as a tourist, then the most important thing to uh, have with you is uh, linguistic proficiency of that place. If not proficiency, I must say like a, a little bit of basic knowledge of that native language really helps you out. So the basic difficulty he had was that he did not, he could not talk to anyone about how the way was about ahead. Until that is, I met Norbu. So this problem was until he met Norbu. So he met Norbu. Let's see who this Norbu is. The cafe was small, dark, and cavernous with a long metal stove that ran down the middle. So this, then he met Norbu in the cafe. The walls and ceiling were wreathed in sheets of multicolored plastic of the striped variety, broad blue, red, and white. That is made into stout, voluminous shopping bags sold all over China. Uh, China. Uh, so he went, uh, he was in the cafe, uh, cafe where he met Norbu. So the, the description of the cafe is there. Like it's, it was a, not a very big one. It was a small and dark and cavernous, so deep kinds of a, a place with a long metal stove. So there in the cafe, there was a long metal stove. stove, uh, stove. The walls and ceiling were uh, covered with sheets of multicolored plastic. So that kind of plastic of whose... Uh, uh, you know, kind the bags are sold all over China and in many other countries of Asia as well as Europe. So as such, plastic must rate as one of China's most successful exports along the Silk Road today. So uh, plastic is one of China's basic export. Okay, so, so whatever the plastic is being exported that is from China along this Silk Road. The cafe had a single window beside which I had taken up position so that I could see the pages of my notebook. So the cafe, because it was a dark one, there was not much light. So he was sitting uh, by a single window so that he could have a better view of his notebook. Uh, I would also, I had also brought a novel with me to help pass the time. So Nick Middleton also had, a, had something to read. Norbu saw my book when he came in and asked with a gesture if he could sit opposite me at my rickety table. Rickety is shaky. So Norbu, when he entered the cafe, uh, the moment he saw narrator with uh, the novel in his hand, he approached him. So what might have made Norbu talk to this narrator? The, uh, the book he was reading because the book was English. So maybe, uh, so Norbu might have been attracted by uh, by the person, the one who knew English. So the kind of problem this narrator was suffering from the same problem Norbu might also have been suffering. You English, he inquired. After he had ordered tea, I told him I was, and uh, we struck up a conversation. So the moment Norbu made sure like I was also in English, he sat and we started talking. I didn't think he was firm. I didn't think he was from those parts because he was wearing a wind cheater and metal rimmed spectacles of a Western style. So the way he was dressed up that made the narrator make out like he was not from that place. 
that he was not a native so he seemed to be like a, that of from western country he was tibetan he told me but worked in beijing at the chinese academy of social sciences so though that that norbu turned out to be a tibetan the one who was working in beijing that is in china so what he was working as he was working as an academician of social sciences in the institute of ethnic literature i assumed he was on some sort of field work so of course he might have been in some uh, sort of field work let's see yes and no he said so yes he was on field work no he was not uh, in field work so what does it mean i have come to do the kora my heart jumped so even norbu had come with the same mission that is to do kora what is kora what is kora to take a round of the holy place okay when you take a round of the holy place we call it kora so norbu had also come to do the kora and even nick middleton had also gone there to do the kora of the mount kailash so my heart jumped norbu had been writing academic papers about the kailash kora and its importance in various works of buddhist literature for many years so norbu's profession was that he was uh, he was working in the institute of ethnic literature and he had been writing upon uh, kora in kailash and its importance in various works of buddhist literature he told me but he had never actually done it himself so he had been writing about kora and its importance but he had never visited this he had never done the kora on his own and now he had come for this very purpose when the time came for me to tell him what brought me to darchan his eyes lit up so when the uh, time came for me to tell him what brought me to darchan his eyes lit up we could be a team he said excitedly so when uh, this person norbu came to know that even narrator had come to do kora there he was very happy two academics who have escaped from the library perhaps my positive thinking strategy was working after all so norbu was very excited and he even uh, commented that yes two academics who have escaped from the library so now they are there in the open to do the kora so he was very happy after all the narrator felt as if his positive thinking was working my initial relief at meeting norbu who was also staying in the guest house was tempered by the realization that he was almost as ill equipped as i was for the pilgrimage so nick middleton was able to make out that uh, norbu was equally ill equipped for this pilgrimage as he was he kept telling me how fat he was and how hard it was going to be so the way narrator nick middleton had many difficulties in going for kora norbu had no less difficulties he was also fat and uh, he he also was very fat and it was very difficult for him to do kora very high up he kept reminding me so tiresome to walk he wasn't really a practicing buddhist it transpired but he had enthusiasm and he was of course tibetan so norbu kept on telling the, the uh, narrator nick middleton about the difficulties they might have to face when they would go for kora uh, yet uh, narrator was able to make out that he was a, he was not a practicing buddha okay the one who actually uh, performs buddhist you know uh, rituals in practice it was not of that kind he was a tibetan although i had originally envisaged making the trek trek in the company of devout believers the if on reflection i decided that perhaps norbu would turn out to be the ideal companion so though the narrator had imagined doing kora with the really devoted pilgrims yet now he was sure that norbu would be his ideal companion he suggested me he suggested we hire some yaks to carry our luggage which i interpreted as a good sign and he had no intention of prostrating himself all round the mountain so it was norbu who suggested that they would carry some uh, they they should hire some yak to carry their at least luggage with them 
because he did not want to uh, he did want to suffer on the kora he did want to actually suffer so at least the uh, yaks would be of some help like their luggage would be carried by those animals so the, their only problem would be to carry themselves so it would be a little easier not possible he cried collapsing across the table in hysterical laughter it wasn't his style and anyway his tummy was too big okay so he had no intention of prostrating himself all around the mountain prostrating means he didn't have the he didn't want to like uh, suffer a lot on the way so finally he said like not possible he cried collapsing across the table in hysterical laughter it wasn't his style and anyway his tummy was too big so finally he said like it was not possible and he was like bursting into laughter so narrator was make, able to make out like this was not his style uh, anyway his tummy means he was actually very fat so this is how the extract finishes because it's only an extract from the from the travel log of nick middleton and here we come to know like how nick middleton is able to reach tarchan and what difficulties he actually faced and we also get a reference to the silk road the silk road which is the main trade route of china from tibet right so that's it hanji stout is fat and voluminous means very heavy and uh, big uh yes children